Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, and say that we love Him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. Let's share a prayer together. Our fathers, we bow before you today. We are so grateful for your work in our hearts and our lives. We thank you for this congregation and we just pray that we might truly reflect who you are in the community in which we live. Lord, we pray that our lives would not be a stain upon you. And Father, we pray that you just bless each one that's here, the families that are uh, represented here, for those that are struggling with any kind of issue, whether it's health or finances or a spiritual need. We pray for your spirit to work in their lives. Lord, help us to love you like you love us. Help us to love one another like you love us. We ask it in your name. Amen. I'd like for you, I'd like to share with you this morning from a passage in Genesis chapter 35. As we think about a fresh start with the Lord. Perhaps you're here today and you kind of need a fresh start with the Lord. It isn't that you haven't at all had the Lord on your mind or your heart, but maybe you just haven't given Him the time and place in your life that He deserves. In Genesis chapter 35, let's just share these verses beginning in the first verse. It says, Then God said to Jacob, Go up to Bethel and settle there, and build an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods you have with you, and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and who has been with me wherever I have gone. I want you to think about this. If you're a Christian, think about when you first came to trust the Lord Jesus. I just want you to get that picture, that image in your mind right now. When you first said, Lord, forgive me. Please come into my life. Take charge of my life. Let me live for you. Think about that. Think about when you really did that, and if you have done that, the, the sense of relief and satisfaction, the joy that flooded your soul, the, the fact that you, would, you were really excited to let people know about the Lord Jesus. Well, I want to give you just a briefly, and, and I'm going to be quick with this, so we hope that our folks back here can keep, keep up with me as we go through this message. But listen carefully, because to really understand this particular passage, it's important that we understand kind of the background that came to this point in the life of Jacob. We find Jacob had an initial encounter with God. And if, of course, if you know the Lord Jesus, then you've had an initial encounter with the Lord. You may have known about him, but you really didn't know him until you came to love and trust him. Now, Jacob deceived his blind father Isaac into giving him a special blessing that Isaac intended to give to Jacob's brother Esau. Now Jacob and Esau were twins, but Esau was born first. 
And so he was entitled to, in that historical period, in that patriarchal time of history, he was entitled to the special blessing. In fact, he would be the one who would, when one, his father passed away, would sort of become the head of the family. Well, Jacob deceived his blind father Isaac into giving him this special blessing. And Esau found out about it when he returned to his father. And he held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given to him. And he said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. And I'll kill my brother Jacob. Now it's kind of, of course, Isaac didn't know this and Esau didn't know this and Jacob and Rebekah, their mother, didn't know this. But Isaac was getting up in years and he thought that he was going to die pretty soon. It, 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 however, uh, he lived a lot longer. He lived to be 180 years old. In fact, even after Jacob had been away for nearly 30 years, his daddy was still living and didn't die till his return. But Jacob fled the promised land. When Jacob's mother was told that Esau planned to kill his brother, she advised Jacob these words. She said, flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. And so while Jacob was on his way to Haran, he stopped to spend the night and taking up one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. This was before my pillow. <laughs> I'll give you a little bit of time there. This was before my pillow. He took a rock and used that for his pillow. And while he slept, he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to the heavens. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it, we're told in Genesis 28 and 12. And there above it stood the Lord, and he said, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Now, this was the promise of God to Jacob. And this was Jacob's initial personal experience with the Lord God. And the Lord also promised, he said, I will be with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. You know, one of the things, if you're a Christian, one of the things you need to understand is that God is in it for the long haul. God intends to stay with you. He's in it for the long haul. When Jacob awoke, we read, that he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. And he called the place Bethel, which means house of God. I have to ask if any of you have lived a life unaware of God's presence. Oh, you knew he existed and you believed in that, but you really didn't recognize his presence in a personal way. But Jacob then made this commitment to the Lord. One that included, by the way, a tenth of his possessions. Imagine that. By the way, this was, this was before Moses and the commandments. And yet we see tithing initiated. Now he continued his journey to his uncle's home in Haran. And while there, Jacob met Laban's daughter, Rachel. And he asked for her hand in marriage. Well, Laban agreed to the marriage, but required Jacob to work seven years as a dowry before the wedding. 
Well, Jacob put in that seven years and he completed it and a wedding took place. However, Laban, his uncle, disguised Rachel's older sister as the bride and tricked Jacob into marrying her. Jacob wasn't very happy about that, as you can imagine. And as he talked about it with Laban, Laban told Jacob that it was not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older ones. But then he offered to let Jacob marry Rachel after one week. But you got to work another seven years. Jacob agreed. And in addition to those 14 years of service to Laban, Jacob worked another six years for his uncle in order to earn possessions for himself and his family. Then we see Jacob fleeing from Laban. After having spent over 20 years in Haran, God spoke to Jacob again and he said, I am the God of Bethel where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. I want to mention this. If you're a believer here and you haven't kept your commitment to the Lord, God's keeping tabs. God knows it. He's aware of it. And he's going to do what he can to bring you back to where you need to be. And all of these years, even though Jacob was aware of God, he was allowing things to happen, to build up in, the life, in his life and the life of his family that really put some distance between he and the Lord. But you know what? Even though Jacob wasn't as faithful to his commitment as he should have been, God was still faithful to his commitment. And in fact, Jacob recognized that. He, he told him, he says, you know, the Lord's been faithful to me. And what did God promise? I'll go with you wherever you go. And so Jacob's family had some crises on their way. First of all, Laban pursued them. Then Esau came to meet him with a group of 400 men. His daughter Dinah went out to visit the women of the land. We don't know why, but in the, in the area of Shechem, she went out to visit with some of the women and got involved in a culture. And what happened ended up being raped by the son of one of the rulers of the area. Well, two of Dinah's brothers sought revenge for the rape of their sister and by a deceitful scheme that involved killing every male of the city of Shechem their sister had been defiled in. And then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel. Remember we read that, Genesis 35 and 1. Go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. God is saying, Jacob, I'm calling you back. You need to get back to the basics. You need to get back to where we started in our relationship and go from there. And so there's a fresh start with the Lord. I'm, I'm so glad that God gives us an opportunity for a fresh start. For if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. But Jacob and his household had not altogether ignored God, but his personal relationship with the Lord and his initial commitment to him was not apparent. He seems to have lost the awe or wonder of God's presence and his promises. If, you, if we were to have read a little more when, when Jacob first had that experience, he was in awe of God. Rather than growing in his relationship with the Lord, Jacob appears to have declined. What would it take to renew his relationship with God? Well, Jacob 
came to recognize that there were some things needed if that was going to happen. First of all, he needed to do what God said. Jacob, get back to Bethel. Get back to Bethel. You know, if we're going to walk with the Lord, we're going to have to listen when he talks. And he talks through the scriptures most, most of the time. In Genesis 35, verses 2 and 3, So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, first of all, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you. You see, if we want a fresh start with the Lord, we need to get rid of those things and that thinking that contradict our professed allegiance to Christ Jesus. We got to get rid of those things. The book of Hebrews says it very clearly. It says we must throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And notice that. Throw off everything that hinders. Listen, folks, there's a lot of good things in the right place and at the right time are very okay. But there's a lot of those good things that we can allow to become a hindrance to us. When we make them a priority or they begin to crowd out our time spent for the Lord and the sin that so easily entangles us listen we live not only in a sinful world but we live as fallen creatures only redeemed through Christ Jesus also recognized not only the need to put rid of those things that would hinder and the sins that really contradicted his allegiance to the Lord, but to purify yourselves and change your clothes. That is simply saying in modern times, don't simply rid yourselves of wrongdoing, but reorient your life to make room for growing relationship with the Lord. That's what it means. That's what he was telling them to do. Purify yourselves and change your clothes. You're going, to have to, you're, you're going to have to have an attitude adjustment. You're going to have to have a behavioral adjustment. And then he says, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God. See, get back to the place where you truly recognize and live in awe of the Lord like you did when you first met him. Let your life be an altar where you praise and promote the glory and grace of God. In closing, grow in your relationship with Christ. How do we do that? You see, you don't have to drift. You don't have to uh, always come back and refresh. I'm reminded of that story of I don't know whether it was a true story or not, but of of this fellow that every time the church had a revival, he'd come to the altar and he'd pray this same prayer. Oh, Lord, wipe the cobwebs out of my life. And, you know, he'd, he'd stay around for a little while and then he'd drift away and they wouldn't see him at church and everything for a long time. And so one time he came And at the last service, he came to the altar again. Oh, Lord, wipe the cobwebs out of my life. And some dear little old saintly lady came up beside him and she knelt down, put put her hand on his shoulder and says, Lord, don't do it. Kill the spider. (laughs) You see... I'm thankful that God allows us to be refreshed. 
But do you know what he does and what he really wants? Do you know obedience is better than sacrifice? He wants us to do what he wants us to do. He wants us to be what he knows is best for us to be. And so, just kill the spider. That's what causes the cobwebs. Kill the spider. How do we do that? Well, we do it through regular communication with the Lord in prayer and by reading and contemplating and applying God's word to our lives each day. We do it by regular participation in worship and in the service of a local Christ-honoring church. How important that is. Do you know a lot of people don't realize that one of the reasons that we gather together corporately in local churches across the world is because God directed us to do that. But also he did that because we are a body. Not all of us have everything we need to function effectively for the Lord. We need each other. And God has made us that way. We're not all, we're not all eyes. and We're not all ears. We're not all hands. We're not all feet. God has made us. He has chosen to gift the congregations around this world. To meet the needs of his people so that we could honor and glorify him and reach others by his grace. And through a consistent fellowship with God's people on a level where deep and personal care and sharing is possible. We don't get that simply by meeting occasionally. We have to become involved In one another's lives. I'm not talking about being busybodies in one another's lives. I'm just talking about being concerned and interested and willing to give of ourselves for one another. That's what Jesus did for us. That's what he's doing each day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. For your precious word. Oh God I want to thank you. For my personal time at Bethel. When as a young man I realized how awesome. Is my God. How gracious you are. I thank you Lord for. Your people, not only here at Christ Chapel, but your people scattered throughout this state, this country, this world. God, help us to reflect your grace. Dear Lord, if there are some here today who need to, like Jacob, put away those things that are hindering, their relationship with you. I pray, Lord, that they'll come back to that awesome God. Renew their recommitment. Father, there may be some here today who have never asked Jesus to be their Savior and their Lord. And I'm praying your Holy Spirit will invite and draw them even today. And I ask it in his name. Amen.